Today we'll be taking a look at the new RTC Champions missions and having a talk about the recent changes. Hello and welcome back to Auspets Tactics, the strategy and tactics focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Now it's the time of the year after the LVO where the RTC looks at their missions, tries to make any changes that they feel are necessary based on player feedback, and makes some tweaks and changes to their mission pack in accordance with these. Today we'll take a look at the updated missions, and talk a little about how these changes might impact the competitive game. So without further ado, let's get into it. First of all, Frontline Gaming have posted a short update on the intent of these changes on their website, which is well worth a read to check out yourself. In general, they say that they wanted to shift away from just killing things to trying to get board control and holding objectives. This has been one of my main criticisms with the ITC formats for a while now, so I'm really glad that they've taken this step myself. You'll still certainly absolutely be able to get some secondary points by killing things. It's just a bit more of a nudge in the way of trying to get table control, rather than being just able to sit back for the first few turns, nuke your opponent's army, and then move up and score a couple of objectives late game and win that way. Not to say that that won't be happening from time to time, but hopefully should just be a little bit less prevalent. They've changed the way that secondaries work, splitting them into two halves, one focused on killing enemy units or putting wounds on models called Seek and Destroy, and all the others lumped into Maneuvers, which are all about holding certain objectives. They've made it so none of the killing things secondaries stack with any other, so you're not going to have the same case where just killing one unit could potentially max out multiple secondaries which I think is generally a good thing, as I didn't really like certain units being basically unusable in ITC because of this. Secondly, they've said that you have to pick at least one option from Maneuvers and from Seek and Destroy, meaning that each army is going to at least need to control some objectives to score max secondary points. Beyond this, they've tweaked a lot of the objective placement, with more emphasis on objectives in the midfield rather than just back in your own deployment zone, made the primary mission of a lot of their Missions far more easy to achieve, as it was very hard before for the majority of them, and have decided to get rid of Seize the Initiative for their Champions missions. Now before they'd done this, I'd recorded an entire video on why I didn't like Seize the Initiative, which will be coming out next week, so personally I'm pretty glad to see it gone. I'll go into more detail in the next video, but basically giving one player every positioning advantage, and also letting them shoot their opponent's army to bits first, just led to two very very unbalanced games, at least whenever I've encountered it. So you get no complaints from me about that. They say that they're going to be listening to player feedback for the next couple of weeks and are going to release these as a formal official mission pack on the 28th of February and finalise them for the upcoming ITC season. Apparently they're also working on another three scenarios, some Maelstrom style missions and are allowing chapter approved missions to score ITC points as well. So a lot of sensible creativity being used in the missions department, which in my opinion is a very positive thing. So let's move on to the actual mission pack itself then. Today we'll go through the pre-game setup and deployment, each individual mission, and quickly run through all of the secondaries, though I am planning to do a more focused video on the ITC secondaries as a follow-up from this one, as they're kind of a massive subject and need going over it with a little bit more detail. So let's talk about the pre-game setup first. First of all, in the official pre-game, before any dice are rolled, players should talk about the terrain around the board, and then both players should choose wall or traits, psychic powers, relics, and spend any pre-deployment command points. The official way to do this is to write them down on your army roster and then both reveal them to each other at the same time to prevent one person getting any advantage by waiting to see what their opponent has chosen. Moving on to deployment, the players roll off first. The player that's rolling higher may choose to be the attacker or defender. As with the new chapter approved missions, the defender gets to roll for the deployment map, pick the deployment zone and deploys their entire army after the attacker, meaning that they get a very good positioning advantage though they will be going second for absolute guaranteed, as Seize the Initiative is not a thing. Furthermore, Frontline Gaming have also allowed them to re-roll the dice for determining which deployment zone that they get, meaning that they're a lot less likely to be lumbered with the deployment zone that they like the least, though it's not 100% guaranteed that they'll avoid it. This is another little buff that the defenders received, perhaps to counterbalance their loss of their opportunity to seize the initiative. After determining the deployment zone, players then place the objectives as per the guidance listed on the mission. They've all got to be placed on the ground floor and can't be placed inside enclosed buildings. And as with ITC rules, you score objectives within 3 inches of the outer edge of the marker rather than the centre meaning that they're a little bit easier to get to compared with the Games Workshop rules. After placing their objectives, players choose their secondaries, 
as we've mentioned, choosing at least one from Seek and Destroy and one from Maneuvers. Each player chooses three, and then they reveal them to their opponent at the exact same time, again to prevent any advantage from waiting to see what your opponents decided to choose. As with normal with ITC missions, each game lasts exactly six battle rounds, there isn't the random game length, which I think for competitive games is pretty reasonable, seeing as the random game length can absolutely decide who wins, just literally by whether or not the player got lucky on one individual dice roll. They've clarified the rules around conceding from a game, meaning that the player who didn't concede will earn all of their kill and kill more primary points for every turn thereafter. And all of the conceding players' units are counted as destroyed for scoring purposes. I believe that they're going to change some of the wording on this to make sure that the killing secondaries for the non-conceding player will be achieved when the actual finalised rules pack comes out. On the other hand, if you table your opponent and wipe all their units out, then you don't automatically receive the kill and kill more points for the rest of the game, and you just play out the rest of the game with just the one side's army's models left on the table, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to win if their opponent has already massively outscored them. In terms of the primary mission scoring, each player can score up to two points at the end of their turn, one for holding one or more objectives, and one for destroying at least one enemy unit during your turn. Also, there's further scoring at the end of each battle round, which gives an advantage to the player going second, in that if you hold more objectives than your opponent, you gain one at more points, and if more of your opponent's units were destroyed this battle round compared with your own, you again gain one more point. So these are the points for killing more and holding more, meaning that on the primary mission, you generally score four points per turn if you're killing more and holding more objectives. Next we come to the secondary missions, which we'll go through briefly here as we'll be doing a more focused video on them soon. You have Seek and Destroy secondaries, Maneuver secondaries, and also Old School. Old School being First Strike, Slay the Warlord, Line Breaker, and Last Strike, with one point for each. This is neither a Seek and Destroy nor a Maneuver secondary, so this would have to be the third one that you picked if you wanted it. As I said previously, the Seek and Destroy ones can't be overlapped with each other, so say you killed a vehicle that's also a character, you couldn't score both points for it for Big Game Hunter and Headhunter for example, you'd have to choose which one of those it was counted for at the end of your turn. Similarly, the Maneuvers secondaries can't be scored by the same unit, holding the same objective each turn. So say you had behind enemy lines and also recon, you couldn't use the same unit to score both of these. They'd have to be being scored separately by different units in your army. So onto the actual secondaries themselves. From Seek and Destroy we have Headhunter, one point for every character destroyed, Born for Greatness, where one of your character units must try and achieve multiple different actions, which can be destroy a unit without the character keyword, destroy a unit that does have the character keyword, deny a psychic power, hold an objective outside your deployment zone, heroically intervene into a unit, and begin and end a battle round hollow within your opponent's deployment zone. Next up is Marked for Death. This has changed to be reflective on points, so you can nominate four of your opponent's units at the start of the game with a points value of over 100 points, and you get one point for each one of these destroyed. You have Titan Slayers. For every eight wounds caused to enemy units with a Titanic keyword throughout the course of the game, you get one point. Gangbusters, which is used for multi-model units with three or more wounds. For every six wounds inflicted on such a unit, you gain one point. Swarm and troops do not count towards this. Big Game Hunter, only one point for every enemy model with a monster or vehicle keyword, and seven or more wounds is destroyed. Butcher's Bill, which is kill two or more enemy units during any one player turn. And the Reaper, which is for every 20 wounds of infantry models destroyed, earn one point, which has changed a bit, as this is now a lot easier to score with multi-wound infantry models, such as Primaris Intercessors, for example. Moving on to Maneuvers, firstly we have Recon, where if you have a unit at least partly in each table quarter, at the end of your player turn, you score one point, and if you have two, then you score two points. Next we have Behind Enemy Lines, where if you have a unit without the Flyer Battlefield role entirely in the enemy deployment zone, you earn 1 point, and if you have 3, then you earn 2 points. Ground Control is 1 point for every objective held at the end of the last battle round played, or if you hold all of them at the game's end, you score all 4 points. King of the Hill is when you have 2 non-character multi-model units within 9 inches of the centre of the table, you score a point, and if you have 4 or more, then you score 2. Next we have Engineers and Sappers. Both of these, you select two non-character, non-fortification units to be your engineers. Starting from battle round two, if your engineers start on end on an objective that you control and don't make any attacks or manifest psychic powers, then you score a point, 
and if you control two and one of them is outside your deployment zone in this similar fashion, then you score two points instead. For sappers, you nominate similar units, but these ones have to go after objectives outside your deployment zone. If they end a turn within three inches of one of the objectives that's outside your deployment zone, they render it unscorable for your opponent's army and also score a point, up to a maximum of two points a turn for having two or more rendered unscorable objectives. Finally, we have the postman which is an interesting new objective where you select a single model from your army that doesn't have the vehicle, monster or titanic keyword, and this can be a model within a larger unit, and the model basically has to try and tour at least four different objectives, and if it's on each one of these objectives at the end of your turn, you score one victory point. So basically if this model has got itself to four different objectives by the end of the game, you'll score four points, and if you've done it on every objective on the table, then you score four points too. So lots of interesting options there, some tweaks to existing ones, and the removal of the Kingslayer objective, which was a bit of an all or nothing one really. I particularly like the way that the objectives don't overlap, meaning this army will genuinely have to be working on objectives in multiple different ways, and both dealing damage to the enemy army, and also scoring objectives, which are the two main things that 40k is about. Let's turn our attention to the actual missions now. Scenario 1 is called Seize Ground. This one has fixed objectives, two near the centre of the table, and one towards each table quarter. I'll put a picture up on the screen for this. And their bonus point is if you hold or contest four of the objectives, then you gain one point, and I quite like the addition that contesting can still count towards this, making it a little bit more doable. There's quite a lot of options for scoring objectives on this one, with so many being on the table, so it's going to reward armies that are able to put multiple threats around in multiple places in the board. And it's a relatively strong one for the player going second, as they can basically try and target the enemy's weakest unit on one of these objectives and try and blow it away, to give them a better chance of holding more, as each player will have to spread their forces around quite a bit if they want to hold multiple objectives. Next up we have Cut to the Heart. One objective is in the centre of the table, and there are two other objectives that the players place, and they must place them within their own deployment zone. If they control both the central objective and their own objective at the end of their player turn, then they gain one point. So this kind of doubles down on the holding more mechanic, meaning that this game is going to be an absolute scrap for the centre point on the table. And it's certainly going to be rewarding armies with big, tough, melee capable units that they can get to the centre of the board as early as possible. Next up we have Scenario 3, Nexus Control. This one's a four objective scenario that the players place all of. They must place one objective somewhere in the midfield outside of their deployment zone, and they must place their other one within their own deployment zone. The bonus point for this one is controlling both of the objectives in the midfield, which frankly won't be the easiest to do, as they'll only have been able to place one of them, and the other one could be very well defended. It should be relatively easy for each of the players to control the one in their deployment zone and the one that they can place likely just outside of their deployment zone. So this one's going to have a bit more of an emphasis on killing things. Next up we have scenario 4, which is what's yours is mine. This one has 5 objectives, one is in the middle of the table, two are placed in the midfield, and then each player places their last objective somewhere in their opponent's deployment zone. So it will be within their deployment zone, but it should be a reasonably awkward one to control for them. The bonus point for this one is to control both objectives that their own player placed on the table namely the one in the midfield and the one in your opponent's deployment zone, which certainly isn't going to be easy, as it involves getting your forces all the way over to your opponent's deployment zone, though likely you will be placing that objective right on the edge, so it shouldn't be undoable. For scenario 5, we have Precious Cargo. This one uses preset objectives, one in the centre and the other four in table quarters, 18 inches from the short table edge and 12 inches from the long table edge. At the start of the game, each player nominates a priority objective, they then move that priority objective 6 inches in a direction of their choosing, and the bonus point can be scored in one of two ways, either holding their opponent's priority objective, or holding three or more objectives at the end of their turn. So a relatively easy bonus point to pick up, compared with some at least. Finally we have Crucible of Champions, again five objectives, but placed in a slightly more complicated way, which I'll show on screen now hopefully. This one has an objective in the centre of the table, two right at the edge near the long board edges centrally and two pretty close to the short board edges, so really quite far-flung objectives all in all here. The bonus point for this one is if a player has three models with the character keyword within scoring range of three different objectives at the end of their player turn, then they score one point. This is the only one that has a bonus point depending on unit type, and it will favour armies with more characters in them, which I can't say I'm the biggest fan of on the whole, as it does mess with your unit selection. 
making you want to take a few more carrots than the list potentially. But that does have trade-offs with the secondary headhunter, for example. It just could be a little bit annoying if you're fighting this scenario with only maybe two or three carrots at most, which might make it very hard to face, compared with a very character-heavy army that might find the scoring a doddle. So those are the champion's missions then. Overall, I think that it's a really good solid mission pack. I'll certainly be looking forward to trying out the new scenarios in the near future. I personally prefer the slant towards holding objectives a little bit more than just killing units, as in general, if you're killing a lot more units than your opponent, you're going to be doing better at scoring the objectives anyway, because your opponent will have less units to hold set objectives with. We might see some more durable horde-type armies coming back with this, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of secondaries people pick. Particularly things like Sappers and the Postman are very interesting in their current form. It'll be interesting to see if any changes are made when these go to their full finalised versions. Let me know if you have any thoughts based on any of these missions down in the comments below, or particularly if you've tried any of them out yet, I haven't had the opportunity yet. Feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics if you'd like to see my video on secondaries, which I'll have coming out within the week. And if you live in the UK and you're thinking of buying any Warhammer in the near future, then consider supporting the channel by buying it through Element Games, who I have an affiliate link to in the description below. Basically, if you click on that one before making an order to have some models sent to you, a small amount of the profit goes to Auspets Tactics without costing you any more, and I know firsthand that they have decent customer service and do decent discounts on Games Workshop products. So it's just one way that you can help to support the channel if you'd like to. Thanks very much for listening to another video. I'll hope to see you guys next time.